once you've um, um, expl once you've taken a look at, at at all of reality and what what is common to all of it, you've hit this that everything is each thing that's real that you, you you have to say of it always two things: this is real, it exi this exists, that exists, the other thing exists. You have to say something common of all of them is or exists or whatever term that you want to use in a language or whatever way they express existence. That's something common that must be said of every single thing that's real. Otherwise, it's despair there. So that's the statement that you make of, of every one. Every being compared to every other being, you have to get a synoptic vision. Any being, like my own self, compared to every other being, I have to make two statements about it. It is, but it is not the others. It, it is, but it is such. So it is not that. This is, but it is not that. So it both is like all things and that it exists. It's unlike everything else in that it is this and not that. Now those two aspects, the is, which is common, and the this, which is unique to each one. Um, those are two, um, two attributes that must be said of everything real. At least when you have more than one, if you just had, had one, you could just say, it is, that's all. But as soon as you have more than one, you have to say, it is, and this is not that. Okay, then when you examine those two, you discover they're really irreducible to each other. You can't, um, uh, because they're, th th they're contraries, that they're not contradictions, but they're contraries, because one negates something. And to say, uh, you couldn't have that things are common like each other by the identical property by which they differ. That doesn't make sense. It's not because they're different that they're alike. That doesn't make sense there. So, uh, and otherwise, you, you, you would say, um, um, if um, John Smith um, exists precisely because he's just John Smith, then everything that exists would have to be John Smith. That's what makes him exist. Or if he's if he if he exists because he's John Smith, or he's John Smith because, then everything would have to have that same. But that's not true because others have existence and they're not John Smith. So these must be objectively irreducible aspects in the thing: the thisness and then the existence which it shares, because the existence is shared by others. So it can't be just unique here. No, it's also shared by others. So then you have to have to go down in the engine room of beings and say, in each being, except possibly one, there must be some kind of internal structure where there's a this that makes it this particular being, and then which enables it, which gives it, helps it to share existence, and then have that in common with with uh, which it shares with all beings. So you have an internal structure of that which makes things unlike and that which makes things like. And you call one the act of existence and the other you call essence. Then you try to relate those two together. Is um, Could you conceive of existence as something, a minimum common level, and then you add on all the different essences to this and that? That won't work because anything you add on it, unless it already exists, you're adding on nothing. So existence can't be a minimum. Uh, then you'd be adding on nothing to it. So be, there'd be no addition. Existence must be an all-enveloping maximum. And then you'd have to distinguish things by subtracting. So you can say this is, but only so far. So by doing, by putting existence as the basic all-enveloping perfection, and then essence as being a limit, progressive limits, then you can work it out, that everything has existence, and yet it's distinct. So you couldn't do it by adding on to existence, because you can't add anything on to existence that, that doesn't exist, be just mental. So existence becomes a maximum, and then you subtract. So if, if, if you had, for example, God thinking up the universe, he would think up images of himself, this is like me, but it's not eternal, it doesn't have, it's not uh, infinite, and so on like that. So all the different beings would be existence with a set of minuses, more minuses or less minuses. Existence but, the only one 
that would be existence uh, unqualified would be the divine name I am period no buts and no qualifications just I am and you've said that as you also said you've said everything although you, you don't know it yet now how do you get to the necessity that there's one being that's just pure active existence well you proceed through the analysis of um, all the others um, except perhaps one would have to be um, would have to be finite because whenever you distinguish beings you say this being is not that being necessarily one of the two must lack something that the other has otherwise they just coalesce into identity whenever you say this is not that one of the two must lack something so um, it's impossible to have more than one pure infinite being so um, every being in the universe then except perhaps one must be finite to distinguish it from all the others now do you need could every being be finite or limited existence that's not going to work because then you do one of the basic mystic ascents to God that no finite being can be self-sufficient any finite being can't uh, no finite being can explain why is it this much existence and no more if it were the ultimate if, if it were self-sufficient it would be the ultimate source of existence and then it doesn't make any sense that it would give existence to itself in some limited way so as soon as it's limited it means it can't explain why it exists in this limited way rather than some other way possible you would need something to select it out it couldn't choose its own limited mode of existence so the, the limitation points to the fact that there's something beyond it and therefore if no finite can be self-explanatory you must ultimately get that the only being that's self-sufficient is going to be the infinite plenitude of existence anything less points you further so by working from the um, from the finitude of existence limited existence and everything would have to be limited except possibly one that would be distinguished from the others precisely because they are limited so that there could be one and only one pure act of existence that's unlimited you say well there must be that because the finites can't explain themselves so that's how you would move that all the others are participated being and they can't explain they can't explain why they have this limited degree they, they also can't explain why they all share the same property if you take any set of beings that share the same real property you say well now why are they similar why are they similar St. Thomas says you can't whenever you have if two beings are, uh, uh, share the same property either one cause the other or they're both caused by a third why is that it's not because beings are different that they're similar you can't say it's because beings are different that's why they all share existence which is similar that doesn't make sense it can't be because they're different that they're similar. can't be because they're many that they've got this unity. So to explain the similarity that's all and have all real beings, you have to go back to some one source which contains that, um, is the source of it, and then gives it to all the others. Otherwise, you can't explain. Um, it's not because they're many that they're one. And similarity is a form of unity. So from those two reasons that a limited being can't explain why it's limited and secondly it can't explain why um, it, it can't explain why um, all the beings share this unity you must get back to one source for that so for those two reasons you trace back the multiplicity of being that you trace back the compositions of essence and existence back to a single source of pure unlimited existence and then you stop